most original talk radio station anywhere. We are LA Talk Radio at latalkradio.com. You're listening to Question Reality. Question Reality. With Priscilla Leona. Priscilla Leona. Only on LA Talk Radio. Hey, welcome to Question of Reality. I'm your host, Priscilla Leona, and we're coming to you live from Studio City, California. You can catch our show every Sunday from 5 p.m. to 5.50 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Now, if this is your first time tuning in, our show is about informative entertainment, and it's done in a fun, upbeat style. We provide you with tips, advice, and resource information on how you can pursue a career in show business. Now, we have guests that work in various professions of the entertainment industry. So that means that we will have someone from a career that you are interested, hopefully. (laughs) And if you want to know who will be on our show in the future, you can visit the official Question Reality website directly. And that address is questionreality.us. Questionreality.us, not .com, .us for United States. And if you want to check out any of our past guests, read their bios, and listen uh, right away or download any of the shows, you can do that by going directly to the LA Talk Radio website. If you're listening to the show now live, you should be on that website. So you just go to the top, click the Schedule 1 link, look for our show, Question Reality, in the time slot of Sunday at 5. You click on the link, and it'll take you directly to our archive page. And there you can peruse all of our past guests. We have Emmy Award winners, Tony Award winners, We have uh, celebrity producers and casting directors, and we have people, you name it, in the business. They're there, and they're giving you helpful advice about how you can break into the business. And they're telling the scoops on the bad side, too. I always like to get the dirt on the trials and tribulations. So, you know, you're going to find out the dark side. If you're not in L.A. or New York, you're going to find out what goes on out here. Uh, You can also download us from the podcast section of iTunes, and that's under Question Reality Radio. Now, we would love for you to call in and ask questions or provide comments on the guest, uh, but we ask that you call in between 520 and 530. And when you call in, we take your calls directly. You don't have to go through a screening process. The call-in number is right in front of you if you are listening to us live now on Channel 1. But just in case, Uh, Let me give you the number. It's 323-203-0815. And we have a fantastic guest for you today, as we do every week. And his name is Brad Mays. And he is a director of stage and film and web series. So for those of you who are curious about the new media, we are going to find out from him him some scoops today on what that is. A lot of you are still concerned uh, who don't live in LA and New York and you're like, I don't know what that is. Is it something new I have to learn? Da, da, da. So uh, we're going to ask Brad Mays about that when we talk to him. But first, we're going to do our lovely advertisements as we do every week. Um, I have, I'm going to advertise myself first, okay? So I'm asking everybody, please, 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 can you vote for me? Uh, I am in a contest to win my own talk show on Oprah Winfrey's cable network. And the contest is on the website, Oprah.com. That's O-P-R-A-H, I'm sure you know, dot com. And you go there, you click on the huge link that says my own show click on that navigation link it'll take you to another link that says browse and vote and there's a search box there so you type my first name Priscilla P-R-I-S-C-I-L-L-A and it'll take you to my voting page and you can watch my video submission if you want to it's very funny but you don't have to to vote there's a little green button right underneath the video that says vote and you can just click it and vote vote as many times as you want Uh, it's up until July 3rd and you can vote all day every day should you be so inclined but if not at least once a day I'm asking um 
I'd really appreciate it very much. I also encourage any of you aspiring talk show hosts to enter as well. It's very fun to do, and um, I don't know. I, I just think it's 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 a very cool thing to be entered in any contest. I think it makes you feel excited about things. So I think again, there's still time until July 3rd. Go to the website and check it out. Um, again, vote for me. All right, I want to tell you about some very important events coming up for all my listeners in the entertainment business. A lot, of, most of my guests, uh, listeners are in the entertainment business, but some aren't. But this is especially for my writers and my television industry folks. The future of 3D production panel. It's coming up on June 30th, and it's at the Showbiz Store. It's the it's the Showbiz Store and StayTunedTV.net. StayTunedTV.net. And they're going to present Safety Geeks producer Tom Conkle. Uh, they're going to have Greg Gorman of JVC and Caleb Grodsky, uh, Zane Witzel of Fishman Productions. And they're going to have um, – It's you can do your networking there. Uh, find everything out that you need to know. Do your networking, marketing yourself. Do your thing. It's going, they're also going to have a panel. So they're, the networking with them is going to be at 6.30 p.m., and then the panel starts at 7 p.m. And it's at the Showbiz Store, which is at 500 South Sepulveda Boulevard in Los Angeles. And it is free, 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 free. And if you want to find out more about that, go to this wonderful website, which has events for everyone that's in entertainment. It's called Event bright e-v-e-n-t-b-r-i-t-e dot com and uh type in <clears throat> safety geeks or the future of 3d production panel and this website is very cool you will find out what's going on go to all of these free cool events if you're a writer a director a producer just in the entertainment business now the writers guild wga is going to present a twilight uh screenwriter on July the 6th, you know, the Twilight Saga, we love it, can't wait for the next one to come out, uh, Twilight Saga screenwriter Melissa Rosenberg, she is going to be doing <clears throat> at the WGA offices, and they're located at 7000 West 3rd Street, she's going to be doing uh, a whole panel and talking about it, also mingling, meeting with you, blah, 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 so that's at 7000 West 3rd Street in Los Angeles, it is $20, but if you want to find Find out more about it, go to the Writers Guild Foundation.org. Writers Guild Foundation.org. Great opportunity to meet Melissa, especially if you're an aspiring screenwriter or if you're following that genre. All right, a WGA Writers on Genre Series. Speaking about genres, Genre Series, that is July 1st through the 9th. And they're going to have a series of action, thriller, sci-fi, and rom-com seminars. And again, that's at the WGF offices, uh, WGF slash WGA offices. Again, 7000 West 3rd Street. That is $80. And again, you find that out at the Writers Guild Foundation. Now, who loves the show Glee? Me, 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 me. Oh, my God, I'm obsessed with that show. I know I'm acting like a teen, right? But I love this show. It's not just for teens. I'm telling you, there are people who are 80 who are addicted to this show. Well, the Glee Writers Panel is going to be on July 12th. Yes, yes, yes. The Paley Center is going to present Glee co-writers and the executive producers who are Ryan Murphy, Brad Falchuk, and Ian Brennan. And that's going to be at the Writers Guild Theater, and that's uh, 135 South Doheny Drive in Beverly Hills, July 12th. Again, that's $15. And if you want to find out more, go to their website directly, and that's at the Paley Center, P-A-L-E-Y, C-E-N-T-E-R dot org. Very exciting. I'm going to be there. Um, now, there is a modern – who doesn't love the show Modern Family, right? Funny as anything. A friend of mine has been on it. He said they've got the best cast and crew. Uh, the Modern Family panel is going to be on July 19th, and it's also at the Paley Center, and it's going to be um, – 
the co-creators, executive producers, Steve Leviden and Christopher Lloyd. You know, Christopher Lloyd, Back to the Future, Taxi, blah, blah, blah. That's at the Writers Guild. Uh, again, 135 South Doheny Drive, July 12th. $15. And again, go to PaleyCenter.org. You should go to that. Check it out. They have all kinds of really cool stuff going on at the Paley Center, which if you're a writer or you just want to go there and check out the various celebrity guests and executive producers. Again, it's a wonderful networking opportunity as well. And um, again, they're having uh, Writers Guild is having a uh, television was it right oh they're having a writing for television writing for television pat it's an all-day seminar for tv writers obviously on july 31st and that's 9 30 a.m to 7 p.m again at the wgf wga offices so that's 150 dollars and you'll find out about that at the writers guild foundation.org writers guild foundation.org and then there's a script writers network tv panel that's exciting on august 14th and check that out at scriptwritersnetwork.org and that's really good for writers in general uh television writers and lastly uh very very exciting uh, a couple of my friends are working on this it is the um what everybody needs if you're trying to sell something okay uh film finance panel Film finance panel. Everybody needs to know, how do I get money for my film project? Okay, that's going to be at AFM on November the 8th. November the 8th, it's a film finance panel at the American Film Market. Again, check that out at the website, AmericanFilmMarket.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I got oh, I got one more thing. Oh, excuse me. July 12th through the 15th, NATBY, L-A-T-V Fest. Yes, Hyatt Regency, Century City. Go to the website, latvfest.net. And um, LATV Fest caters specifically to television industry professionals and insiders as well um, of those who are looking to develop strong working relationships in digital and traditional media. So this is a three and a half day summit, and it'll feature an opportunity to learn from producers and executives that are at the top of their game. You can also pick your show idea to successful production and development companies and network yourself with the decision makers who can take your career to the next level. So it's very, very important. Just to give you an idea of who's going to be there, this year's lineup includes Chris Harrison. You know, he's a host of The Bachelor, Bachelorette. Um, there's Shira Lazar, who's uh, one of the people at cbsnews.com, Michelle and Robert King from one of my favorite shows, The Good Wife. Uh, there's going to be a keynote speaker who I love, love, love this guy, Howie Mandel. As you know, he's now on America's Got Talent is one of the panelists. And, um, oh, also there's going to be uh, digital and TV executives from NBC, Warner Brothers, UTA, Catalyst, Tube Filter, Stars, MTV, and many others. So they'll be able to answer a lot of questions about the new media, the digital stuff. So the panels are also going to include the anatomy of the hit web series uh, produced. The, oh, oh, very exciting. They're going to be talking about uh, producing content for the smartphone, uh, personalities that pop, how to find the next reality superstar inside the writer's room, social media and TV, and 34 other workshops and sessions and seminars. So, woo, you got to get there. And you know for you writers, they've got that highly regarded pitch pit, which is returning for its seventh year. So you know you can't miss that. Um, nowhere else. Can all the registered attendees get two exclusive guaranteed pitch meetings with top level broadcast cable, digital, and studio development executives and agents? So, you know how important that is. And they have 50 confirmed companies that are going to be taking pitches, including Three Ball Productions, APA Talent Literary Agency, Fox, Hallmark, Mar Vista, NBC Universal. It goes on and on and on. Also, William Morris. And this year they've added mentor uh, round robins with industry and uh, insiders from production companies, law firms, consumer brands, you name it. Now you can register today. You got, you better get in there and register right away. Cause this is a hot one. People LATVFest.net. LATVFest.net. Now, 
today, since you're hearing it on my show, if you use the promotion code 10 fest 1 O F E S T you will save $100 off the publish rate which is 495 okay so get on that right away woo we got a lot of activities going on in the entertainment industry very exciting for you people all right we are finally getting to our guest today again Brad Mays Brad Mays he is um an award winning veteran of Dozens of stage, television, and independent film productions spanning 30 years. And Brad Mays is now with the completion and release of The Watermelon and Singularity, as well as the production of his new web series, Featherweight. He is finally, he feels he's coming into his own as a filmmaker. Now, Mays was recently asked to appear in front of the camera, which is a complete role role reversal uh, that he says he found exhilarating, but also a little bit nerve-wracking. And it's for a new PBS series on world theater and literature produced by Annie Wong. And um, in the episode devoted to uh, Euripides, uh, 2,500-year-old masterpiece, The Bacchae, Mays is teamed up with Nobel Prize winner Wally Soyinka, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, legendary theater maverick Richard Schechner, and famed Scottish actor Alan Cummings. Coming, And other films include the award-winning A Way Back In, The Bacchae, and Stage Fright. Notable stage productions of Mr. Brad Mays include The Water Hen by Stanislaw Ignacy Witkiewicz. Woo! Say that by Thank you! Thank you! Woo! Thank you! Don't feel bad. Thank you. I was doing pretty good. You've only had to correct me once, right? And I'm almost doing done. Very well. <laughs> Dragon Slayers by Stanley Keyes, a multimedia adaption of a clockwork orange. Euripides the Bacchae, Peter Weiss, the, per- the persecution and assassination of Jean Paul Marat, as performed by the inmates of the Asylum of Sheraton under the direction of the Marquis de Sade. Equus and many, 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 many others that you can fit in uh, in 30 years. So we are going to welcome him today, everybody. If I had some sound effects, we'd be cheering and there'd be a drum roll. But instead, I'm just going to say, hey, Brad Mays, are you out there? Welcome. Well, I'm here. And who needs a drum roll when they got you here on the radio? (laughs) (laughs) You're on the brass band all by yourself. But I'm going to find a drum roll. I'm going to actually go out and buy a drum so I can give it a little sound effect. I think the guest deserves a little little drum roll on a Sunday at 5 o'clock. <laughs> I'd be very careful. I think that there's an energy threshold. Uh, <laughs> 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 I think you're already pushing it now. So. I love that. I push the energy threshold level. I've never been so complimented in my life, Brad Mays. <laughs> well, good. Uh, now, let's see. We, you've done so much. Um, I always like to take it back to the beginning. This is just standard operating procedure on my show. I want to know, when you were itsy-bitsy, teeny-weeny tot, and you were thinking about, oh, I want to be this when I grow up, what were some of your thoughts? What did you want to be when you were a little boy? When I was a little boy, oh, this is fun. When I was a little boy, uh, I wanted to be a train engineer. And then when I was in fourth grade, I wanted to be a scientist. Uh, Then I found out that there was a lot of math involved in science, so then I wasn't interested in that anymore. Mm, And then when I was in seventh grade, I think I wanted to be a hell's angel. (laughs) Well, not that I knew what being a hell's angel involved, but I think that's what I wanted to be. Uh And then uh, what happened in, uh, in 19... Gosh, I don't really remember... Uh, 1970, 1969, right around there, uh, I was in high school. I was living in Princeton, and I saw a film called Catch-22, directed by Mike Nichols, of course, the Joseph Heller novel. And I watched that film one afternoon and decided that day that all I ever wanted to do for the rest of my life was direct 
I just it, it put the hook in me in a way it's never let go. Just uh, amazing. What so was I, it about? What was it about it that put that hook in you with the from the with all the things that were going on in that? Why the directing? Why did that one? Why directing rather than oh, I want to be an actor in the in that film? What was it, what was it about it that spurred you to the directing? Well, I I thought that the visuals in it were just stunning. You know, there were there were some visual setups in that film. Uh, for instance, there was a there was a shot looking into one of those B twenty nine bombers that had, I guess, plexiglass noses, and the actors sitting at various levels within that nose were all having a conversation, and it was a very very convincing shot. They may have actually been in flight. I'm not going to rule that out. But at the very least, it was a very convincing shot of a plane ostensibly in flight, and all of the voices were coming over the radio system, and you could see who was talking through the plexiglass. My jaw just hit the floor. I'd never seen anything like that before. And I thought, well, you know, a film film director, hmm, 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 you create a world. Now, what was also going on during that time was um, the Vietnam War and, of course, counterculture and everything. I got totally sucked into all of that. I'm very serious about it, too. There was a lot of stuff like that going on in Princeton at the time, mainly because of the university. So what happened to me was I became totally, totally drawn into the idea of theater and directing and all of that. At the same time, I was really, really involving myself in in reading about politics and reading about the world. Now, I'm making myself probably sound a little more studious, you know, than I actually was. I was also a 15-year-old, and I was also crazy, out of my mind. Um, <laughs> but, but I mean, all that energy had to go somewhere. Mm-hmm. And uh, once I got locked into this, that was it. It just never let go. We had a fantastic drama teacher in Princeton High School uh, who ha- had a direct link to the uh, regional profession, uh, professional theater in Princeton that was called McCarter Theater, fantastic theater to this day. They had a regional company there, and I started doing professional productions, you know, I mean, playing little tiny roles, you know, sometimes roles with no lines, but I was regularly cast in, in uh, roles there and uh, got to work with professional people. John Lithgow's father, Arthur Lithgow, uh, ran the theater at that time. So lots of people came through. You know, Christopher Reeve was uh, involved in McCarter Theater pretty much at the same time. So I just got hooked. I just got hooked into it. And um, I got in a little bit of trouble. Um, <laughs> and so you're 15. Instance, what, what could you do back then? Was there uh, an opportunity for you uh, to, uh, you know, buy a camera and go out and make little films? Or what did you do with all of this enthusiasm towards wanting to be a filmmaker once you discovered oh, it? Well, I, I started, I start, I got into, involved in the uh, drama program at the high school, you know. Now, um, I, I didn't want to act. I wanted to direct, but it seemed to me that I had to learn how to act in order to right. learn how to direct. I remember doing a few shows. I did a couple of the professional shows there and did a couple of the high school shows. And I, I talked to the, the drama instructor, uh, Don Evans, uh, he, he, the late Don Evans, a wonderful man, a fantastic African-American playwright, had his, his work done all over the world. And I think it was a real honor and a privilege uh, to, and a blessing to have worked with somebody like that because he was into the cutting-edge stuff in New York. I mean, he was into that stuff, you know, and, and uh, he was directly involved in it. I remember one day in, in drama class, I was going through the New York Times. I was trying to find a, a play in New York that I wanted to see. I didn't know anything about theater. So, uh, you know, he says, well, what are, you, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm, I'm trying to find a play to go see in New York. He goes, well, what are you, what are you looking at now? I said, uh, I this thing called uh, Butterflies Are Free. He goes, that's something your grandmother would see. That's not what you want to see. You want to see this. And he pointed something else out. And at that moment, I realized, okay, there's a lot more to this stuff than I know about. Um, but he gave me a sense of purpose and, a, and, a, and an aesthetic sense. I remember seeing a film um, by Ken Russell called um, The Music Lovers. And there's this Fantasia scene uh, where it's a film about Tchaikovsky. And, and it's a really wild piece of work. And there's a scene during the 1812 overture. There's a, a, a sequence where Tchaikovsky is taking his music on tour and he's conducting. And there's this Fantasia with the 1812 overture. And when the cannons start going off, in the fantasy world of Tchaikovsky in his own head or who named any other character might be going in their head too. He's blowing off the heads of his former lovers. 
So I was talking to Donald Evans about this, and I was saying, it's just incredibly grotesque. And he said something that I had never forgotten as long as I lived. He goes, you know, sometimes the most horrific thing can also be beautiful. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, when I, I, I eventually became a great lover of the, the films of Stanley Kubrick, and, and that's something that you, you get constantly in his work is, you know, the idea of war, you know, some of the most horrific things you could ever say, see, witness, experience. You know, also, there are moments of indescribable beauty. Uh, and that juxtaposition is, is, is uh, one of the, de- you know, the deeper things that you can get into thematically when you're, when you're directing. So it's, it's just a vast, vast smorgasbord. If you have a, if you have a penchant for, the, for literature, if you are visually literate, if you like sight, if you like sound, if you like music, if you like images, if you like storytelling, there's nothing like directing. So, That's exactly uh, eventually- what I was going to ask you. How, in your opinion, I'm glad that you were just saying that, in your opinion, what, if a person's confused which route to take, they're a young person, and they say, well, I'd like to be an actor, but I also am interested in director. What you were just saying, what do you feel uh, you need to seek out in yourself to follow the path of being a director? You were just naming some, but what other characteristic traits do you think you need? Well, I think theater is a really great learning ground, and there are a lot of filmmakers now, especially those that come out of film school, who frown on people who come up through a theater background. And certainly in Los Angeles, there's a tremendous chauvinism in place. You know, oh yeah, you've directed theater. Okay, big deal. Well, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but some of the some of the, and you know some of the best directors that America has ever produced in, in filmmaking. People like Mike Nichols came up through the stage. What does the stage teach you? Well, A, it teaches you how to organize a drama, a presentation. You know, a lot of people just think that the, uh, filmmaking is about nothing but being creative, being, being brilliant, you know, coming up with ideas and, you know, basically directing is problem solving. How do we convey this scene with the maximum amount of impact? What about this tricky language here? You know, how are we going to deal with that? What about the rhythm here? It just sort of seems to stop. You know, now if you're working on a film set and you're shooting, right, let's just let's just take a very bad scenario here, very bad case. Let's say you're you're shooting nine pages a day and you don't really have a lot of experience working with actors, and you hit a brick that you didn't realize, you know, a brick wall that you didn't realize was there the first time you read the script because you don't have a background in doing this kind of thing. What you have a background in is in, is in cameras and Final Cut Pro and the stuff that they throw you at film school. Now you're dealing with a big, big narrative with big themes and moments something that they may not have ever mentioned in film school, the idea of moments, beats, little fragments that divide scenes up and, 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 and uh, the, uh, the, the collection of which, you know, as you pass through them within a scene, add up to a sort of an internal structure on a scene-by-scene basis. If you don't know this stuff, you're going to be lost. So I think, I think that it's very valuable to uh, spend some time working in the theater and do some of the scripts, you know, Shakespeare, you know, Arthur Miller, um, a, a, a directing teacher that I had later on, you know, when I was in my 20s, told me that I, I was uh, dramaturgically lazy, and I, he was right, by the way, and uh, he told me that I should do a couple of Neil Simon plays, which I considered to be a tremendous insult. Well, la di da you know, here I am at the age of 22 being insulted by the notion of doing Neil Simon, a perfectly fine playwright, somebody who's enjoyed enormous success in his field. Well, the reason he suggested that to me was that Neil Simon's plays, his comedies, are all about structure. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a sense of dramatic structure, if you don't, in point of fact, even know what it is, which was the case with me back then, well, you learn real fast, because Neil Simon's plays are pretty much nothing but structure. I wish I had taken his advice. I would have learned a, th- a number of things that it took me quite a few more years to learn. So, yeah, theater is a great background. You learn how to work with actors. You learn that uh, when you say something stupid to, a- to an actor, you pay for it. 
you learn that um, basically it's not all about you standing up and talking and, and, and being the big cheese. It's, it's usually about you solving problems. And, and you learn humility. You learn to suspend, you know, your, your sense of ego and your sense of you know, purpose as you define yourself and just serve the peace. It's a wonderful thing. Mm. Of course, it's very seductive at the same time because it, it leads you to believe that there's always time. Oh, there's time to fix this scene. Oh, yeah, we'll do that next week when you're making a film. That is not in point and fact. Right. Case. You have to deal with it right then and there. But... A background in theater, I think, buttresses you and, and gives you uh, an advantage. You know, it gives you, uh, I, I, I'm reluctant to use such a vulgar phrase, but you have a bag of tricks from which mm-hmm. to draw. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a bag of tricks, you know, I mean, you, a bag you of need tricks. You, what? you need as many tricks as you can get. Right. Where, no I, matter yeah, where yeah. they come from, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, and what, right. what would you say, uh, characteristic traits, would you say, uh, to go into the theater and uh, you start off as an actor because, I mean, you can't start off as a director. So you start out as a, an actor doing little bit roles if you can get them. Um, how do you say with community theater, how would you recommend that, say you live in Kansas or Oregon or a small town and you want you go to your local community theater, you know, as well as I do, it's very clicky. Um, how do you recommend that you get into this little theater click? Because I know from my experience, uh, it's kind of hard to get into the theater click, especially if, if you're not known. How do right. you break into that little community theater so you can get your start? It's pretty simple. You know, don't expect instant results. Don't expect, you know, a quick fix. Go in and make yourself indispensable. Run errands. You know, assist the director. You know, right. be a stage manager, you right. know, be there when stuff needs to be done, be always there, always be on hand. And at a certain point when they seem to take a genuine interest in you and your aspiration, say, what I really want to do is, is direct. That's really what I want to do. If that's here, that would be great. Or if I just play my time out here and, and learn as much as I can and, and, and direct somewhere else, I can That'll be fine too. You know, you have to, you know, you have to humble yourself and and be very, very clear about what you want. But at the same time, you have to learn to make yourself indispensable to people. You know, you have to be able to provide some kind of service. This is something that a lot of people in the arts don't understand when they come out of art school. You're not rewarded in 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 the professional world of the arts for having talent. That's kid stuff. You know, mommy and daddy take you out to dinner, you know, and, and throw a party for you because you were wonderful in Romeo and Juliet at high school. <laughs> that doesn't happen in the real world. You're only going to be hired if you are useful to somebody. And being useful to somebody generally means that you help that person to make money in some way. Exactly. And if you're not doing that, then you're not living in the professional world of the arts. Right. And I know that. That probably Excellent. sounds a tad. A big part. Excellent point. Excellent point. Because that's Thank what you. it's all about out here. So if you're if you have a goal of moving your way from Padunk to New York or L.A., listen to what Brad just said. That's exactly what it's all about. You gotta be able to be useful and show some money that you're gonna make them some money. Because I hate to say it, show business is business. Am I correct? Very much so. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the craziest businesses there is, and it'll it'll just make you uh, totally insane at times. Right. It can be a, it can be incredible fun, and and you you'll go through moments of tremendous despair as well. But the bottom line is, you have to be useful to somebody. You're not right. you're not there in order to serve your own sense of how brilliant you are or your own mm-hmm. ego. You are there in the service of an audience or the service of a project, the service of the piece, you are always serving someone, like Bob Dylan wrote. you got to serve someone. That's, That's right. what it's all about. Now, I come from East Coast in a time where when I worked in community theater, you, 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 just, you, you just went in and you asked 
if well, what I did, I went in and I asked, hey, can I get involved? And it just so happened that they needed an assistant stage manager because the stage manager at the time, God love her, she had narcolepsy and she would fall asleep in the middle of being the stage director. And my job was to tie her up and keep her in the chair. So I was very lucky. It just so happened. I just went in. Now, they just let you get involved in community theater. Let's talk about how you come out here and all of a sudden to be involved with community theater, you got to pay a fee. All right. Well, it's not community theater out here. You know, you're right. Exactly. Now, yeah. Let when you come that. to Los Angeles, when you come to Los Angeles, when you go to New York, all of a sudden you're not really dealing in the community theater world anymore. Right. Now, one of the problems I have with Los Angeles, I, and I've directed in New York City, I've directed in Baltimore, I've directed in Washington, D.C., I've directed in Los Angeles. Um, and there are things that I like about all those areas. But one thing I can say about Los Angeles, and it's very, very tricky, is uh, if you're coming out here and you're not known, if you're really not a known quantity, probably what's going to wind up happening and uh, is, is that you're going to be gravitating toward actor-driven companies because they're always looking for directors, all right? And actor-driven companies are companies where you pay your dues and you're part of this group and they do a series of plays every year. But it's also a highly, highly political kind of situation, highly charged. All these people have their own goals and their own ulterior motives and their own internal politics. And these can be very, very insular very insular productions, and despite how welcome you might feel while you're being drawn in to do one of these these pieces with such a company, and these companies are all over Los Angeles. They're everywhere, and and a lot of them do fantastic work, you know. But what is very very likely to happen is if you don't really fit in with that group, then you're going to know it within the next <laughs> within the first few rehearsals. All of a sudden, people aren't smiling at you anymore, and all of a sudden, this was sort of a snotty attitude, you know, with some people, and it it, it can be kind of weird. I mean, you know, I I um I don't again. Do it's particular... very clicky again with the. Clicky all, right, all right, well, all right. There you go. All right, I guess I guess that's a good way of putting it's it. It's a click. Yes. Yeah. You either but... fit in or you don't. And if you don't come from LA, and they do. You gotta admit there is a slightly different mentality involved. Like when I first came out here, and I uh, was hired to direct a play, and I wanted to do warm ups and do an energy circle, they looked at me like I was insane. But that's well, what I was taught. And they're like, oh, we do that at home and in the car. And I said, well, we're going to do it on the stage today. Surprise. Yeah. And uh, no, not happening. So what? let's talk about that. How does one, if you come from the East Coast or anywhere that's other than New York, L.A., and if they have a real specific way of doing things, do you acclimate to their way of doing things? Or do you insist on doing it your way because, well you know it's better. <laughs> well, it's always, you know, it's always about picking your battles, you yeah. know. I mean, and, that, and that's always true no matter what you do. Now, I understand the situation that you were in, um, and, and I recognize it, you know, but you have, to, you have to recognize the fact that this company is filled with people who have spent a lot of money, you know, studying acting and going to school, and they have dreams and aspirations and their own portfolios that they've been working on and building up over years, you know, they have their own goals, you know, so sometimes, sometimes there's always going to be a few days where you, they're expecting you to prove yourself to them. That, I mean, that, that always happens no matter what. So it's very conceivable, very possible that you fail to, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be uh, Oh, I didn't fail because I got those little bitches to do an energy circle every single rehearsal. And by the time I was done with them, they were loving the energy circle. They oh, okay. loved well, it. Oh, Fine. my God. Are you kidding? But it's the way that you approach it. I mean, I didn't go in there and say, well, we're doing it, little drama queen bitches. We're doing it. No. I did not do that. But I right. said, well, let's try it. It's a lot of fun. And I, I, I explained a little bit about the Uda Hog, and it's like, what are these people on stage? Uda who? Um, but, you well, know, see, they, that, that's, that, 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 that's kind of inexcusable for them to not know who, 
Well, then I is. felt, and strange. you're going to find this a lot, in that uh, they were there doing a play, which you're going to find a lot out here. You're, they're here doing a play, but their goal is to be walking the red carpet and to be an A-list actor in film. Well, and, I, I mean, I that's that's, a, and they don't really, they don't really care about theater, but they know that there are going to be agents and managers and people in the business that that might possibly scout them, and that's what I. I found doing theater out here a lot. Well, I, I wouldn't work with a company like that in the first yeah. place. You know, yeah. I, I mean, I'd, I'd go there, I'd meet the people, and uh, 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 this ain't going to happen. This is not exactly. for me. I mean, you know, <laughs> well, I didn't come out here to do theater. I was doing theater in New York. I, I was, right. you know, so I came out here to do film. I had made a feature film in New York. It had, it, it had actually played at the Berlin International Film Festival, my first film. All right. So I Yay. thought, okay, well, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to California. I mean, they're going to love me, right? And of course, right. I'm, just like, I'm just like everybody else, right? right. But, oh, well, what am I going to do with all this free time I have? I guess I'll direct some theater. So yeah. I did a few plays. I did, a really, I, I did a show that I really liked when I first came out here called Dragon Slayers. It was written by a friend of mine, Stanley Keyes, and uh, we got a fantastic cast for it. It's about a group of insane puppeteers living in Berkeley, California, <laughs> and, and, and these people go nuts, and they, they, they enter into the personas of the puppets that, that they've created, and the, the puppet troupe, uh, the puppets themselves, become sort of this murderous cult. And one oh. of the members of the yeah one of the members of the puppet troupe is ritualistically killed in in the most grotesque way I could possibly cook up on stage and it was and pretty you important. love it you love it <laughs> oh hey man I delivered I delivered on that one but we had a terrific <laughs> show. Oh, we did it was a good Wait. show it was a really good show I had fantastic actors we had uh, uh, Philippe Simon who does a lot of TV now he's a French actor uh, one of my best friends too we had uh, Colleen Shelley who has done a tremendous amount of theater in Los Angeles. Was Jack Tate, who was a guy that I knew back in Princeton, who came out here and just kicked all the doors open. He's, he's he works all the time. Jim Dotton, who uh, was in Animal House, played uh, one of the Hitler youth. Um, everybody knows who he is. I, just a terrific cast. Had a wonderful time. And. Uh, no. Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry, Brett. I want to because of, of time because it's 5:41, and I tell you, I could keep you on here for four hours, and you better believe I'm gonna be begging you to come back. But I want to get in a couple of things. I understand there was a new development. You, um, you're going to be directing your first play since 2003. It's uh, very controversial, and it's called Prophecy, written by Karen right. Malpede, uh, just closed in New York. Tell us about that. Well, this is strong stuff. And I, and I really thought that after A Clockwork Orange um, in, in 2003 that I wasn't going to do any more theater, at least in Los Angeles. That was, yet again, another show that was done at an actor-driven company. And it just, I think the production was, you know, it turned out well enough as, as, a, as a theatrical presentation, but it was one of the worst experiences I ever had on a personal level in my life. And so it was, it was a deeply disturbing and upsetting situation. I just said, hell with it. I'm not doing this anymore. You know, this is for the birds. Mm -hmm. So I haven't done any theater at all. And all I've been doing is, is film work. That's it. That's all I've been doing. And, um, and loving it, you know, um, it's, it's difficult. It has its ups and downs, but, uh, I'm definitely making a living as a filmmaker. That so is fantastic. I've got, well, Yay. I've got a feature. Yeah, I've got a feature that just went into distribution this past year. I've, I've two of them actually. What's the uh, name? Documentary. Singularity, uh, which uh -huh. is a documentary film about opera works, about an opera training program here in California. Um, yeah. And then the feature, uh, comedy, The Watermelon, which I'm very, very proud of, um, which uh, was uh, the number one film in audience and industry buzz at the San Diego Film Festival. It's now in distribution. Okay, so I mean, this is pretty cool. So, so anyway, I'm doing it, and and it's great. But all of a sudden, can we, can we see these films anywhere? Um, sure, yeah, them? yeah. If you have, if you have Netflix or Amazon, just, just okay. Singularity. So, it's called Singularity. It's uh, uh, it's about opera training, and 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 it's kind of weird because it's sing in cap all the capital letters, and then Ularity. Uh, it's from the uh, phrase "Put thyself into the trick of singularity" by Shakespeare. So that you're getting a Shakespeare lesson now. And then the watermelon. Um, so if you go to Netflix or Amazon.com and type Turner, in, Turner movie you classics, you know, I mean, it's out there. You, you know, yeah. There's, so yeah, so. if you want to see Brad's work, uh, definitely go to Amazon.com and uh, Netflix, which I'm going to go to right after we get off of the air because I want to check out your work. And um, now let's talk. We've got like. 
five minutes, but I'm telling you, you are a gemstone to have on the radio. I got so many questions. I had ten questions. We haven't even gotten past three. Uh, well, let me, just say talk- a, let me just I say a quick to- word about prophecy because you did ask yes, about go that. Ahead. Right? Yeah, I- yeah. Yeah. So I, I wasn't out here looking for more theater work, but I, I came across this play, Prophecy, uh, by Carol Mapede. Uh, might, be, might be Malpede. Uh, I'm not sure. But it's, it's a stunning adult piece of work that deals with the, the political situation between Israel and, and, uh, and, and the Palestine. It, 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 it's really, it's really a, a shocking. It's not funny. But at, at moments, tremendously shocking and powerful play. And it, it just sort of jolted me out of a sense that I didn't want to do any more theater. It had played in London. It had played in New York. They had just recently closed it in New York. And they're seeking to do it in Los Angeles. So I got into a dialogue with her. And she was interested in the fact that I had done Euripides the Bacchae because that's her favorite play. So she looked at the article that, uh, you know, there's an article about me in Wikipedia, and she went through all that stuff and, and, and found clips and stuff of the work that I had done. And we in- started into this dialogue. So we're going to be doing an independent production of this play, not with an actor-driven company. We're going to do it the way I like it, with an independently financed production. We're looking at the Coast Playhouse right now as the venue for it. And I hope to open this piece sometime in either late uh, 2010 or in uh, 2011, uh, Prophecy by Carol yes. Malpe. I am, I am so – you know, Vanessa Redgrave has championed this play. Um, and David Swanson has championed it. It's strong, strong stuff. It's life affirming. It's it, it it doesn't it doesn't try to teach anything on a didactic level. It just throws all of the issues that we're facing right now on an international level. It just throws them right at the, at the audience's lap, and you have to sort through it all. It's honest. It's brutal, and it's funny, and it's my kind of piece. It's dangerous oh. stuff, and I'm going to do it. Yeah, I love it. I love how you said that, and I'm going to do it. Well, count on me for a little donation. So you get in contact with me. I'd love to contribute. I don't know how you do your financing, but I'd well, love I'm to. sure Carol will love you for that. Yeah, <laughs> come on. She's, I'll tell you, man, this, this woman, Carol Malpete, is, is really a, a very, very formidable human being. She's incredibly brilliant. Her skills as a writer are second to none. I mean, she is world class as a playwright. And I just, I just am thrilled to death to be doing this, and I, and I feel like I'm. Her inspiration for writing it is she oh, uh, has she experienced something with, with the content or? I would never, ever, ever presume to speak for her on this, but okay. you should have her on and ask her yourself. She would oh, make a yes. tremendous. Oh yes! Oh, would you send her contact information to me? Uh, you'll have it this evening. Thank you, my darling. She's the real I'm thing. Excited. She's the real thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited. Well, I want to come see it, and I will definitely contribute, a, give a little donation, because God, I love theater, and I know how hard it is getting financing for, for theater, so count me in on that. And um, now we've got three minutes. Um, I want to talk just briefly about uh, web series. You're doing oh, yeah. some web series. How different from television and film? Just g- give me something. Well, you know, it's really not that different because, yeah, look, I'm not an expert on web series, okay? I don't. I, People are scared of it. Everybody's asking me, oh, what are the rules? You know, da 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 da. Well, I, I say, you got to call the Screen Actors Guild. I don't, I cannot give you any information. They have a very, the very, Guild. they have a very wait and see policy at the Screen Actors Guild. They're, they're not doing anything to impede productions. Um, I, what I'm doing is I'm shooting it just like a movie, I'm shooting okay. it with a real film crew. You know, with the director of photography that I love working with, Larry Malloy. My God, I mean, he is so fantastic. He, you know, he he uh, he uh, apprenticed under um, Ansel Adams. The man is a real photographer. He really knows his stuff. So we're shooting this like a feature film. I mean, Better you know, five-ton trucks. You know, I mean. Are you, feather, are you talking about featherweight? Is that the name yeah, of it? Yeah, featherweight, right. Yeah. Okay. But we're shooting it to technical specifications that would enable me also at a later date to chop it together in a different way and, and release it as a feature, a standalone feature. What, so, where is um, it being aired now? Where can we see this? Yeah, you know, It's not going to be aired until September, but we're already oh. shooting. And okay. it's going to be aired at uh, Cineplex Studios, uh, the cineplexstudios.com. 
uh, a guy named Fred Copeland is putting this company together. They're, they're the online distributors of the series, but we basically still own the series. And uh, eventually, uh, I, would, I, I, I plan to re-edit it with some additional footage um, that is not quite so necessarily um, you know, PG-rated kind of stuff. It's a little grittier. And then so you're saying the so you're saying it's a web series, but you're not you're you're gonna do a premiere and then put it on the web, or are you gonna shop it? In a, no, no, no. I'm 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 putting it on the web at, at okay. Cineplex Studios uh, for whatever a number of episodes that I wind up being contracted okay. for, and we okay. haven't signed all the paperwork, but it's definitely a go. Okay. Um, but eventually, eventually, I'll still own the material. I may want to do something else with it, or not. Who knows? Um, yep. I'm just taking a very optimistic view, just doing the best work I can, and I'll see if I find an audience for it. But it's, it's about a woman who finds Jesus and boxing on the same night. Hot damn! Jesus and boxing at right. 5.50, we have to go, and you leave us with that tidbit, and you have titillated us with that. So I am, I'm all booked with guests until the end of the year, but may I please beg you to come back as a guest next year at your convenience? Well, all you got to do is invite me. I, I, oh, I put, Brad, you are phenomenal. You are like one of my best guests ever. You're just so terse and succinct and obviously educated. Terse? Uh, I'm you're cursed. Cursed. You, <laughs> I are, I was you actually, up you are. You haven't heard some of the guests that have been on my show. So oh, okay. yes, you you are terse and concise and succinct. Absolutely. Thank oh, you Lord. so much for being on the show. I'm going to get in trouble if I don't cut it off right now. I, Thank you, Brad. Go to his website, bradmays.com. Check his work out on amazon.com and Netflix, The Watermelon and Singularity. Thank you, Brad. God bless you. Thank you for being on the show. We'll see you next week. Take Bye. Bye-bye. Do you need a website but don't think that you can afford one? Do you dread the thought of even doing the research to find a company that you can afford? Do you cringe because you know that the person you talk to will try to sell you more than the advertised price? At Design on a Dime websites, we pride ourselves in being able to design original, professional, efficient, creative, and extremely affordable websites. Your website design will load fast, be customized to fit your needs and vision, and be presented in a clear, concise, and easy-to-read format with user-friendly link navigation. We challenge you to find a company that has lower prices and better customer service with beautiful, original designs. So... Gather some dimes together and call us today at 213-687-6903 or visit us on the web at designonadime.us for your personal consultation with a very friendly representative who will be able to give you a great website that fits your budget. You're listening to Question Reality. Question Reality. With Priscilla Leona. Priscilla Leona. Only on LA Talk Radio.